Welcome to the Branding Room Only podcast, where we share career stories, strategies, and lessons learned on how industry leaders and influencers have built their personal brands. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, everyone. It's Paula Edgar, the host of Branding Room Only, where I bring on industry leaders and influencers to learn how they're using their skills, talents, and experiences to create and amplify their personal brands and to hear their observations and advice on personal branding. I'm so excited because today's guest is Michelle Banks. She's the senior advisor at Barker Gilmore, and she is everything. I have loved Michelle since the first time I met her. Uh, but let me tell you what she, let me give you the bio. Michelle is a former general counsel who now provides executive leadership coaching to women general counsel. She's also a professional speaker and she serves on nonprofit boards. She writes and she convenes women lawyers. And I have to just say, point of personal privilege, she's one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire <laughs> life. So, Michelle, welcome to the Branding Room. Well, thank you for having me, Paula. And thank you for that compliment. I appreciate it. Of course. So um, our conversation is going to be uh, all things today, but I'm going to start with what I start with, with everyone, which is what does a personal brand mean to you? How do you define it? Your personal brand is what you're known for, what people trust you to do, and hopefully what you enjoy doing or are best known for. I love that. I love that. I love the trust piece because I think um, if you have a, a personal brand that's strong, it builds trust, right? It, it's a part of that, how that kind of weaves itself into the whole thing. So how do you um, describe yourself in either three words or short phrases? Um, I am a connector or community builder. I am a giver. I am authentic, direct, honest, maybe too much so sometimes. Yeah, you're definitely a connector and a community builder. And I love that. Those are, um, those strongly resonated uh, in terms of how I know you and how other people describe you as well. So tell me, do you have a favorite quote or mantra that you sort of use to direct your life? Well, it's interesting because um, I was thinking about favorite quotes and I've listened to a few of your podcast episodes and I felt like people had such lofty quotes that they read. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very simple. Um, and I actually realized that I don't even know who originally said it, but our mutual friend, um, Michelle Coleman Mays, says this a lot when she speaks publicly. And it's, here's to strong women. May we know them. May we be them. May we raise them. And as you know, Paula, so much of my career has focused around supporting women, building community with women, and empowering women lawyers. And I've heard Michelle say that quote, I don't know, probably five times in different professional contexts. And it's just, it's very impactful to me. It makes me get goosebumps. Mm -hmm. As you said it, I thought to myself, my edit to the end of it is something that I know that you do. And so does Michelle. Um which is maybe mentor them, right? Um, and 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 you definitely um, do that. Okay, so since you've listened to the podcast, you know the next one is about your hype song. So when you are walking into a room and you want people to know that you mean business, what song is playing in your head? Or, and or, when you are having a down day and you need to pick yourself up, what song are you playing? It could be the same song or different songs. The interesting thing is I almost never play this song, but it plays in my head, which is Queens, We Are the Champions. Nice. Um, when I'm trying to have a powerful moment or thinking about bringing a group together in a powerful way, We Are the Champions um, plays in my head. And it's funny because I don't know the whole song. So there's only a few phrases that, that play in my head, but mm -hmm. I listened to the full song a while ago. And I realized that I think one of the reasons why maybe I like that song is because it's actually not just a positive hype song. It's also about overcoming and perseverance. And mm -hmm. so I think that's part of why it's really powerful to me besides just some of the words. So speaking of that, so give me a little um, rundown of your story. Where are you from? Um, we have your bio, but tell me about how 
where you're from and what you've done has evolved your personal brand? Sure. Well, I mean, the most obvious way is I was a corporate lawyer and then I became a corporate executive and then I became a leadership coach. Um, And those are really pretty different things um, and impacted my life in many ways, including the flexibility that I have now, you know, now that I have my own businesses, coaching and speaking similar to you, you know, I control my schedule, I control my balance between my family life and my work life. For many years, I was very heads down billing hours as a lawyer, and then many years, you know, focused around solving global crises around the world pretty 24 Mm seven. So a lot of things have evolved for me, from what my practice is, to the people I spend time with, to the flexibility or control that I have now that I didn't have before over sort of what I focus on and how I spend my time. Yeah, a flexibility is is so key when it comes to, I was just talking to someone earlier about entrepreneurship. And I said, the reason I want to be an entrepreneur is because I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. <laughs> Well, and I didn't even realize how much my life was controlled. My husband has always been an entrepreneur and he mm-hmm. just used to look at my life and think I was incredibly crazy. In fact, he would say to me sometimes, what do you mean you never went outside today? You know, what do you mean you never got up today? You sat mm-hmm. at your desk or in a meeting all day. Mm-hmm. And I never thought that was unusual. And now it's probably the biggest shift for me is that I move, I'm always moving, you know, I'm walking, I'm playing tennis, I'm skiing, I'm, you know, walking up and down the stairs, you know, I just, Mm -hmm. I I have embraced movement, and I feel so much better, because I have a ton of energy. And it's helpful when you can move with that energy, instead of being more confined in your work. Yeah, you know, I'm taking that as a message from the universe because you're the first first person today, but third person in the last two days who has said to me that they have walked and talked. Like they do, they do a lot of the, the work while they are moving in order to make sure it gets done. And I think one of the legacies of the pandemic is we've gotten real used to sitting, right? Like sitting, sitting was a thing um, during the pandemic, but you know, um, I think it's good to have that energy and we walking around and working it off and all that good stuff. So I'm going to take that as a challenge. Um, okay. So you have talked about the different um, roles that you have had, but what kind of platforms have you used to build your brand? I speak a lot like you. Um, mm-hmm. I speak at least once a month, sometimes up to three times a month. Like this mm-hmm. week is uh, this month is a whirlwind on speaking every week. Yeah. Um, and that's easier you know, especially in the virtual world with podcasts like this or webinars, which my firm Barker Gilmore does. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I also go to a lot of in-person events and I love that. I mean, that's been the most exciting post pandemic thing for me is getting back out, engaging with people in person. Um, I'm going to Atlanta this week. I was in Chicago last week. I think it was in New York the week before I'm in Mm -hmm. San Diego next week. Um, Call, call, fall conference season is um, is a little bit overwhelming, but it's also super fun for me too. So um, I would say probably the number one way I've built my brand is by speaking publicly in a lot of different forums to diverse groups of people. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, I would say LinkedIn. I'm on it almost every day, not necessarily posting every day, but um, you know, reading other people's information, engaging with people, meeting new people. I really enjoy it. And it's interesting to me to think that um, when I retired as a general counsel, I think I had, you know, less than a thousand connections on LinkedIn. I really used it as sort of a modern Rolodex just to keep track of people I had met. Yeah. And I didn't engage on it at all. And slowly over time, I've engaged on it more and more and been more opening open to connecting to new people. Mm -hmm. And now I have this big network of, I think, I don't know, 8,000 people or something. Mm -hmm. And I really get a lot of joy from it. And I enjoy um, the connecting with people, but I actually get a lot of business from it Mm -hmm. too, which was not at all what I started engaging on it for. Mm -hmm. But it's been interesting to me um, that in both my speaking and my coaching businesses now, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not most of my clients, but there's a, you know, a significant group of people that reach out to me because they follow me on LinkedIn or because of something I have shared on LinkedIn. 
I, I, I tell people all the time, like it's the most powerful tool that you have for branding and relationship building hands down because everybody's it's it is like a big role in it. it's like but it is, huge, and it's free it's exactly free. exactly exactly um when you were talking just now and, and i was thinking about um how we got connected and and you know we what we have in common is a love and passion for an organization called Ms. jd we have a lot of other things come but that is what brought us together and um and when we were at Ms. jd last year uh, for all of you who are listening, I have had the honor of being um, one of the open keynote speakers at Ladder Up, which is a conference that brings together general counsel, women general counsel, and women associates at law firms for really in-depth and thoughtful mentoring and connections with each other and professional development. But um, Michelle, you you said you you made us, you went and looked at all of the followers all of us had, and you were like, you have X amount of followers. I was like, oh my gosh, like, I had never really thought about the actual number. And it was that, it was on that day. I was like, I'm going to get to 15,000 followers. And I just did. <laughs> so, oh, congratulations. Yeah, so like, thank you. Thank you very much. It, I was like, I feel challenged because everybody knows I love talking about LinkedIn, but I hadn't really had anybody say to me like, hey, this is what you're doing. What are you doing about that? So that was a good um, coaching moment for me. So thank you. Um, Let's talk about um, Ms. JD a little bit and, and ladder up. One of the things that I noticed about that um, event, and it's really, really powerful um, for those of you who are general counsel who are listening, uh, women general counsel and who are uh, law firm associates, you know, try to get there. And also we want to see you there. Like it is just a powerful, powerful thing. Um, but what resonates for me, Michelle, is that the general counsel who come, they are like, I am friend of Michelle. It's like, it's like a sorority. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And and I think about your brand, it's like people, I mean, not that anybody's going to be like, you know, say bad things, but people say the best things about you and about how much you have impacted um, their careers and how um, they would do anything for you. And I would just, what, what if the things that you have done to kind of build that cohort of Michelle's peeps that will do all these things for you? <laughs> um. Well, you know, and it, it wasn't necessarily intentional in the beginning. It's mm -hmm. interesting when you reflect on things, you see mm -hmm. things that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. So, for example, last year I contributed to the book Women in Law. Mm -hmm. And um, we all reached out to our networks and asked people if they would support our book in some way, maybe posting about it, maybe hosting us to a book talk. You know, we asked a lot of different people and organizations if there was any way that they could help support women in law. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, immediately like 10 different organizations offered to host us and to help me. Mm -hmm. And the co-authors of the book were like, how, how did you do that? And I <laughs> said, well, you know, I, it was really a moment for me to stop and reflect and think about. And I said, well, all those people owe me favors. And it's not <laughs> like I did things for them. Right. You know, some of it was years before. It, it wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily like I thought like, oh, I'm going to do you a favor because I'm going to write a book and then you're mm -hmm. going to give me an opportunity to use your platform for a book talk. I mean, I right. just never even thought I would ever write a book or anything mm -hmm. like that. But but it was just that I do a lot of things to help other people. I enjoy it. It's part of my nature to be giving and to do pro bono and to support other people. Mm -hmm. And then it comes back around and helps me build my brand and helps get women general counsel to come to Sonoma and mentor the women law firm associates. And in part, it's because they see me doing it and mm -hmm. see that it's fun and it's impactful. Um, and in part, maybe they owe me a favor. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is truly, truly impactful. I, you know, what um, you and Danielle and all the, the, the team and the folks and um, Megan, everybody who's put in towards um, it, you know, I, I feel honored every year to be a part of it. And oftentimes when I go to speak, um, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm giving, but this event is always like, I'm also going to get because it's just a wonderful reminder of the power of when you convene women, right? Like it's Well, and you're being humble because you are the opening speaker <laughs> every year and you always start us off with incredible inspiration and energy. And I really appreciate that. You know, this is a, 
um, a passion project for myself, Jan Kang, who was my co-founder, and Megan Belcher, who is now taking it over for me. Thank goodness, six <laughs> years in, I'm sort of losing some of that energy that I normally have. So, um, you know, it's a great event. And everyone tells me what you just said. Every mm -hmm. single woman general counsel, whether they're a friend, a client, a mentee, however I've gotten them there, they mm -hmm. always tell me afterwards or write me afterwards and say, I came to give, I came to mentor, but I got as much out of it as I get, as I gave, because it's just really a powerful community of women lawyers who are there for nothing other than supporting each other. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It, it is powerful. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the things that you have done and you have been um, a general counsel for some pretty big brands. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and for those of you who will go and, and read her bio, I'm just going to pull out two because I think when I think about um, pivoting from one to the other, I really want to know what what you were thinking and how um, you might have had to shift or or maybe not um, when you went from one brand to the other. So I'm thinking of you being a GC for Golden State Warriors, <laughs> then going to the Gap. Like, how is that for you? I just think to myself, basketball clothes it's like, was the actual work similar or you know what I mean I, no, I, don't, I don't know what I'm nothing to about it was similar <laughs> but first of all I wasn't the general counsel of the warriors I was the legal counsel so I was the number two person uh there were two of us um that worked at the lawyers in the law department and that's a good description of what the yeah. difference is right so mm. gap is this huge global company with 150,000 employees and a law department of over 100 people the Golden State Warriors is a small NBA team, and there was myself and the general counsel, and the general counsel was actually a law firm partner who only worked part-time about one day a week at the Warriors. I was the only full-time lawyer there. Mm -hmm. um, so very different organizations, very different environments, very different brands, as you brought up. Um, you know, the NBA is one of the ultimate powerful brands. And from a brand perspective, it's interesting because when you're a team lawyer, you don't do that much of like the intellectual property work and the so-called branding work because that's very much controlled by the sports league association. Mm -hmm. And then a gap, it was different because, you know, it's a private company, um, but it's also a public company. So um, you're always balancing the different interests of your stakeholders, your shareholders, your employees, your customers. Mm -hmm. And Gap is also a lot more than Gap. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Gap has the Old Navy brand, the Banana Republic brand, the Athleta brand. So a lot of well-known brands and the brands have slightly different identities and customers. Um, but yes, I think after working at both the Warriors and the Gap, branding comes very natural to me. So you know, personal branding, for example, wasn't something I had to learn. It was something that just came very naturally, having worked at two very consumer focused, branding focused companies. Um, and actually, clothes is more of my natural fit than basketball. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> clothes are natural fit. I got it. Um, um, you know, I, I'm glad that you you kind of got to where I was trying to get. So um, with the question, which is, is when you are aligned, when you are your own brand and then you're aligning with a brand, um, sometimes it meshes really well and other times it doesn't. And it, it, you know, it sort of depends on whether you kind of get it. Cause I also, I always think to people, you know, people will say to me, well, Paula, you know, I'm my own person. And of course you are your own person. Everybody's their own person. But when you work with, you know, someone or work with an organization, you do align with their brand, whether or not you want to or not, because they are part of your brand now because you work there, right? Like it's, it kind of overlaps um, on it. And I just thought when it's a big, big brand, um, understanding that piece, and I talked about this in, with Latanya, how do you navigate that and then your own brand in that at the same time, but being going towards the same goal. So you kind of hit it right out of the park with what I wanted you to pull out. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay. okay. All right. So We've already kind of gotten to this a little bit, but I wanted to pivot specifically about how leadership and volunteerism has helped you with building your brand. And, you know, you, you're involved with nonprofits um, and you have been a leader. How do those things in specific um, help with you building your brand? Well, I think that people can see you when you do pro bono work 
um, especially when you do group work like boards or committees or um, groups of some form, people see you in action and you build your reputation with people. People start to trust you. We were talking about trust earlier. So actually, when I first started my coaching business, it was really interesting to me. I did just a little back of the envelope analysis after my first year. Where did my business come from? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, I think it was a third of it came from people who I had served on boards with. Mm. Um, because, you know, you just, you get to know people, you get to trust them, you get to see what their skills are when you volunteer with them. And when you have common bonds, because, you know, you're usually, if you're on the board of an organization or volunteering for a committee or some kind of group, you usually have some passion around it. So you, you know, you, you create bonds quicker. I love that. And that's how, how I've done um, that same thing with, with leadership and bar associations. You know, you, you, you know, who the type A's are, you know, who the workers are, you know, like, you know, all of that. And, and it, I do think it is a driver of a lot of things that folks don't necessarily put a connection to. Um, uh, and also when you don't do it well, it also is a driver of your brand in a different way too. So yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, I'm going to skip that one. Um, what mistakes have you seen people make when it comes to networking and building their brand? Well, a couple of things. First of all, not doing it. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of people, lawyers in particular, which is my community, um, who are so focused on the quality of the work or the amount of work they do. And there's some natural reasons in that profession why there's a lot of drive to bill hours, for example. Um, but I think it's really important to realize that brand building and networking are super important and you have to think long term, even if they're not important in your daily life today, they will be important in your trajectory and long term of your career and you need to build them before you need them. You know, I mean, we've all seen with the economic downturn and some of the struggles that companies have had, um, at least being in California, where I am, there's a lot of layoffs, for example, this year. Um, and that means that people needed a brand and people needed a network. And hopefully they're not deciding this year to build their brand and build their network because it works a lot better when you build it before you need it. Whew. That I'll be sharing that, that clip just right there is going to be what I'm pushing and will go viral because it is so true uh it really saddens me when i hear from somebody that i haven't heard from from 10 years who's like hey paula good to see you again i'm looking for a job and i'm like who are you again Am I, I haven't seen you we haven't connected and again that doesn't mean i can't help but it does mean that it's harder to flip and ask because you haven't made the investment in the way that other people who you know have could um so i love that that you you pulled that out as it's so important to invest in yourself always and so that you don't have to worry about it later on um okay and i'm going to ask this from two perspectives one what advice do you have for people trying to build a brand and i want you to think of this from the perspective of coaching folks what do you see people maybe struggle with and then what advice do you have for them um in general on um, building a brand and then i'll ask you the second part afterward i think it's take some risks I am a really big believer in smart risk taking. And I think that sometimes people hold themselves back and they just won't put themselves out there, whether it's they won't make the connection, they won't make the ask, they won't, you know, stand up, they won't speak. You know, I just think um, the best thing you can do to build your brand is to take some risks and experiment with what works. And I think the best brand builders have done that. Uh, make the ask. It is. Um... It is wild how even people who have really, really in-depth and deep and big networks don't ask, <laughs> don't wait, uh, who don't say, I need X, Y, Z, because really, in particular, I think when, when we bring women together, that's a powerful piece, right? Because we want to help each other. Um, and when you can leverage and ask on top of that, it's much more powerful than, than sort of just doing it in, in an abstract or in a vacuum because there's a momentum to it. And um, I was just at a conference a few weeks ago where they deliberately said, turn around and ask somebody for something. And it was like, <laughs> but- Oh, that's a great exercise. Yeah, but I like so that. much, so much came out of it because we were 
pushed into our discomfort, but uh, magic happened right after that. So yeah, we should incorporate that next year. <laughs> it was just great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, okay. So now I'm asking you the question from the perspective of, um, from the book, the the woman in you know law discovering the meaning of, of success. What do you think were some of the deliverables, the takeaways about building your brand from the book? Sure. I think one of the things that really hit me, there's mm -hmm. three themes to the book, but the mm -hmm. one that hit me the most is your brand can change. You're not stuck with your brand. You know, you can evolve your brand over time and probably you should evolve your brand over time as your interests change, as your life changes, as the environment changes. So um, I think the most successful people reinvent themselves. Yes. Yes. I, I, I and uh, everybody, I'm going to put the link to um, how to get the book in the show notes. So um, you'll be able to to grab that. But I think that it's, it's such, it's so powerful, right? Because if you think this is who I am and you're never going to iterate, you're never going to, that, that sort of, I'm stuck here, but I want to be stuck here for me. I'm like, what, then what, <laughs> like, right? <laughs> then what you, you gotta, you know, switch it up and you, and you have to, I think, want to always be learning and growing. And, and that's a part of brand building too. Even if you stay in the same role, you can always um, invest and do better. One of the questions that I get asked the most um, about branding from people who are in-house is why do I need to build my brand if I'm in-house? <laughs> Um, and you already hit on one piece, which is, you know, the economy is not necessarily um, one that is going to say that you're going to be someplace forever. But are there other things that you've seen uh, in terms of success stories or um, or your own that specifically focus on brand building when you're in-house helped um, to, you know, for success in that space? Well, I think some of the things that people don't think about if they make that kind of a statement are that you need to build your brand internally, too. You know, you're not just building your brand for an external audience, you're building your brand internally as well. And I think that, you know, what I used to tell people is you need to build your brand within the legal team outside of your own function. You then need to build your brand within the company outside of the law department. And then hopefully you build your brand in the community of other in-house lawyers and I don't think that I did that enough early in my career. I think it came more naturally to build my brand within legal and even within the company. I didn't have to be pushed very hard to do that. But I had to really be pushed and almost forced into building a network of um, lawyers that are in-house but outside my company. And I mean, I just can't tell you how valuable it was once I did it. Um, the benchmarking, the support, you know, the referral sources, you know, I got so much out of becoming a part of different communities, but I really didn't do it until I started the compliance function at Gap. And I really didn't have a choice because I didn't really know what I was doing. And I needed <laughs> to learn what other companies were doing and tap into resources that and learnings and um, you know, grow and share with other people. And then I realized, why didn't I do this before? Like, this is very helpful. This is, you know, and so I went from really not being a part of many communities outside of my company to, you know, leading the National Retail Federation General Counsel Forum, because I really came to realize that the time that I spent with my peers would really help me and help my team and help the company. And it was a valuable use of my time. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> so um, I just heard about this, that conference. <laughs> it's like, it's happening next week. And I was like, it looks like the best thing ever. Uh, I had, but I'd never heard of it before. And then all of a sudden I keep hearing about it. I'm like, look at that. It just keeps happening again. Um, I was like, I like clothes. I don't, but it's, I made a joke. But, well, um... that's actually a different one. <laughs> Interestingly, there are two retail oh. associations. There's the National Retail Federation, mm -hmm. um, which was what I was referring to. Okay. And then there's the Retail Industry Leaders Association. They're mm -hmm. both fantastic associations. And yeah. I have the privilege of having been a part of both mm -hmm. because GAP participates in both. Mm -hmm. One, NRF is more focused around smaller retail, especially retail and very apparel focused. Gotcha. And Rila is the big retailers mm -hmm. and it's, you know, targets of the oh. world. 
Um, and so we were lucky because we were big and because we were specialty apparel, we were in both. And so I'm actually going to realize that's why I'm going to Atlanta next week. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, okay. So let's get to, um, well, I, I'll ask the question directly. What advice, if you haven't already given it, do you have for people who are trying to build their brand? Um, get on LinkedIn mm-hmm. and use it as much as you're comfortable with. And I think people should st- stage it. Like, mm-hmm. so if you don't have a profile, of course, create one, but now it's hard to imagine it's the most trusted social media and it's, you know, mm-hmm. millions and hundreds of millions of people. So probably everybody at least has a profile, but build mm-hmm. your profile. They have the thing on LinkedIn called all-star profile. And so I think that should be everyone's goal is to mm-hmm. fill it up enough to get to all-star status and make sure it reflects who you are. One thing that surprises me about lawyers in particular, which again is sort of my community, Mm -hmm. is that they'll spend endless hours, days, months working on their resume. And then Mm -hmm. so little of it is reflected in their LinkedIn profile. And nowadays people don't really focus on resumes. It's interesting, even when you have someone's resume, you still look them up on LinkedIn. (laughs) So I think- I think um, what I advise people to do is, you know, build your profile and then start engaging with other people's content Mm -hmm. and, you know, start by liking stuff, then eventually commenting on stuff and then eventually maybe contributing and, you know, do what you're comfortable doing. But um, I think that LinkedIn is really, really powerful and it's an incredible way and a free way and an easy way Mm -hmm. to control how people perceive you and your brand. I, you know, I love LinkedIn. So yes, everything you just said, everything you just said. Okay. So tell me about the fun stuff. What do you do for fun um, when you're not working? (laughs) When I'm not working, I'm usually doing something with my family. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I come from a very close Italian immigrant family where, um, you know, I'm having dinner with my mother and two of my sisters and my son and my husband tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have dinner with my husband most of the time, but, Mm -hmm. but you would be surprised at how much time I spend with, you know, my parents, my siblings. Um, We are a very big, close family that, you know, I, love spending time with and you know that's really my joy and my son is temporarily back home living with us having just graduated from college and searching for his first job and that's a real special treat for me to have him in the house um and um, hopefully we will be launching him soon into his career and i look forward to watching that and seeing what he does too Oh, yes, it is. It's a powerful thing to see your kid move from stage to stage. You know, my daughter's a freshman in college now and and it's only three months in. And I'm like, you're totally different than you were when you left home. (laughs) Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's two points that I always include in all of my podcasts, which is two moments. One, it's stand by your brand. So what is um, an aspect of, of your brand that you will never compromise on? My commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. It's such a passion. It's so important to me. It's something that I became committed to in 1992 when I lived in Japan for a year and experienced being an other and an outsider for the first time. Um, It's the first time I fully understood the need for not just diversity, but inclusion and belonging. And um, so it's, it's a very important passion to me, as you know, because we see each other at MCCA and lots of other events like that. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then the next one is your um, branding room only moment. So branding room only is a playoff of standing room only, uh, where essentially, you know, you're in a space where everybody wants to see what's going on. So you can't sit down. So what is the skill magic about you that folks would fill up a room and there'd be standing room only for? That's a hard one. I guess I would say authenticity, maybe. I, like I said, when you asked me to describe myself, I'm very direct, I'm very honest, I'm very authentic. And I think that makes people comfortable um, because I'm kind of always me in whatever setting it is. And I think that, you know, hopefully 
I make people comfortable. I agree. And I'm just going to go ahead and throw my own edit in there about what I think your branding room only moment is. And it, because I've been in the rooms where the room is full and they're all looking at you, which is, is that you're authentic, but you're also empathetic and you read rooms and you read people really well. And, um, and it makes you a really good interviewer because of that. And so um, I would say it's all of those things, but, and especially that um, some people can be really rehearsed and kind of robotic, but you are who you are all the time and you reflect how the other person is when you are um, connecting. So I think that that, that's your brandy room only in addition to what you said. <laughs> well, thank you, because that is important. As a coach, I teach a lot about emotional intelligence and empathy in particular is the one that I focus on. So I'm glad that comes across. <laughs> I'm doing my job then. You are doing your job. Um, Michelle, it's been wonderful to talk about everything with you today. Um, is there anything else that you wanna share with folks before we go? Um, how to connect with just you. Just the people, I was going to say, just people should feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I accept um, anyone who is a lawyer or a coach or anyone who says they heard me speak. I will always accept their invitations. And I look forward to growing my network and helping people. Fantastic. I appreciate you the time you took to chat with me today. And everybody, I know that you enjoyed the episode um, because you probably hear me smiling right now. Um, tell a friend, um, subscribe, like the podcast, and um, I'll see you next time in the branding room. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Branding Room Only podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to hit subscribe to get future episodes.